This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us. And I'm sure many of you are thinking, why would you do a webinar in the middle of a growing season now? Uh, some of it is that um, we want to get this information recorded and out there so people can access it and then reuse it. So many, many more people will be watching the recording of this. So my job really is very easy to introduce my wonderful colleagues here that I've had the pleasure of working on with this project for a little over uh, 14, 15 months now, probably longer than that, that we maybe conceptualized it. And really what it was, was bringing the BMP uh, practices to life. How do we understand why or why not some of the key practices that we think are best for protecting uh, water quality and pollinators um, are either implemented effectively or not implemented effectively. So we can find out the strengths and weaknesses of our approach to getting them adopted and then move in that direction. And so I have the pleasure of introducing my program, Assistant Carl Scamenti, uh, Program Manager for our Turf Crash Program and Golf Course Engineer ec uh, Extraordinaire. He'll give us some data on the background of this project that we've collected so far. And then my esteemed colleague, the former superintendent at Locust Hill and at, and at Centerpoint, I think he'd want me to say, uh, golf club, uh, in, the, in his a lifelong golf course superintendent, Rick Slattery, host of more than 20 uh, LPGA events uh, during his time at Locust Hill. So here's a guy who knows what he's talking about from the mom and pop operation all the way uh, to the highest level that the pr profession is practiced. So without any further ado, Carl, why don't you talk to us a little bit about the nature of this project, what the data is that we're acting from, and then Rick's gonna talk about the practices. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the introduction, Frank. Uh, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned the word engineer. You called me an engineer in the opening. Um, but really, we're working with a bunch of engineers um, at the RIT's uh, New York State Pollution Prevention Institute, P2I. Um, they're housed in the Scalasano Institute of Sustainability. But, but these folks have done this sort of project in a bunch of different industries. Um, you know, they've done it in the auto industry. They're doing it with wineries, breweries. Uh, these best management practice focused versions of this in different industries, but they have a very kind of uh, process oriented approach to driving adoption of best management practices. And so th there's a very kind of stepwise approach going here. So the first one is, is pretty obviously we have to define our BMPs. Uh, and Frank, you were very significant in codifying the New York State golf course BMPs for protecting water quality back in the early 2010s, uh, one of the first states in the United States to really codify these things in a document. So for us, we sat around for, for months really and decided which, which one of those are the most important? Which ones do we wanna figure out uh, what golf courses in our region are doing? So we kind of pick and choose, uh, chose a lot of those BMPs from this document uh, as our starting point and we created a survey. So then, okay, we have to evaluate adoption and we have to go out and administer this survey. And again, one of the things the ERP folks do is they basically define their boundaries. They call it a universe of, of facilities. So we defined our boundaries into these counties in upstate and western New York. Uh, central, upstate, western New York, maybe the vernacular there on what is uh, upstate New York changes based, based on where you are. But they defined our region and then they said they counted up all the golf courses, used some statistics to say, okay, you need to evaluate, randomly pick 40 facilities administer this survey to get a representative sample. And the random selection here is important because, you know, I think when we've looked at BMP adoption in the past, whether that's a GCSAA national survey or even us doing some surveys, um, it was never truly random, right? And, and survey bias happens when the people who respond to surveys are a certain portion of people and maybe you're, you're leaving out some people. So our ability to really randomly sample, to take our time to, to get all these golf courses uh, was a big deal, big deal, and it makes the data very uh, useful. So we'll look at that data in a second. Uh, but the third step is once we get all that data, uh, is to really kind of do the intervention phase. And that's where we are now. It's through these things like webinars, podcasts, um, kind of our seminal core document is this, uh, this poster in the middle, Golf Course Sustainability Practices poster. We sent this in the mail to all 200 golf courses in our region. Uh, and then we've also posted it online. Hopefully people have, have seen that and can print it out themselves. But basically we've distilled the, the core concepts of these BMPs that we chose to focus in 
onto this poster and to give you kind of really a snippet version of uh, you know, what the BMP is and why it's important um, to create awareness for a lot of people who may just not know about BMPs. Um, so we hope we hope to do field days as part of this kind of uh, education phase as well. Uh, and we'll write up case studies as we go along and, and do some uh, some interest, some, some brief assistance work, we call it, with, with courses one-on-one. -on -one. So uh, this whole phase that's going through this summer and will bleed into next year a little bit is all about uh, creating awareness and driving adoption into to key BMP areas. Uh, and then the final step, step four, is uh, to, to go back again and say, did it work? So we'll do that same survey process. 40 random golf courses again, and see uh, if if the work we did worked. And, and we hope it does, this is what we're gonna try and do, but uh, that's an important part is to see if, if um, we can drive adoption in some, some meaningful way. Um, so we split our BMPs into these four categories, right? Water, nutrient management, uh, pest management, and, and point source pollution. Today, obviously, we're gonna focus on the water, the water component with Rick, uh, we're going to do three more webinars like this, focusing on the other areas. Um, but I thought it was important to look at the data. Okay, what, what did we find when we did these surveys? Um, so you notice some interesting things. The, um, the highly adopted ones, you know, between three quarters of people visually check all their irrigation heads every year, right? That's something we, we hope everybody would do, can, can visually look at if, if all their heads are operating at the beginning of the season allowing some moisture stress, right? We want some people to dry their turf down, make it a little bit more resilient, not rely so much on everyday frequent watering, uh, and then eliminating irrigation and out of play areas. So all this kind of speaks to uh, not only making the turf stronger, but saving water. Uh, and generally courses in our area are, are good at that. Um, but there are also things we're, we're not so good at. Um, and there's different reasons for this, we'll get into that, but uh, using a moisture meter, only 20% of golf courses in our region uh, have a moisture meter and use it. Uh, even fewer use evapotranspiration data when they're planning their irrigation. Um, so, so those are two kind of technologies that, that people haven't adopted quite, quite to our liking in these areas. Um, and then some documentation things. So having a map of where runoff goes on the golf course, only 12% of golf courses have that in our region. And a drought emergency plan, not something we think about in New York, maybe that's a Southwestern United States uh, sort of thing, thing to have, but uh, as we go through climate change, as water um, comes less frequently, but in larger amounts through rainfall, uh, we're gonna start to need to think about that in New York State. And, and it, it's been clear that we haven't really thought about that um, so far. So this is some of the data we've seen, we're gonna target our education towards this uh, but, but just as important as the data was the conversations we had with superintendents. Um, and that it's, it's not kind of cut and dry that, that you do or don't do a BMP. There's reasons for that. Now, some of the reasons I would say are, you know, quote unquote, controllable. Um, you might just not be aware of the BMP. You might not know about it. Um, there might be this old school mentality. I don't want to say that's a bad thing, but um, especially with, with new technologies like moisture meter or using ET data, there can be some hesitancy to adopt those sorts of things. Uh, and then of course, fear too, when we say things like, hey, allow some moisture stress, th there is a fear on the superintendent's behalf of, well, I, I don't want my, my turf to die. Um, so those are, are things that you can kind of control. They're not limited by um, your, your ability to spend money or your infrastructure, um, but they're more kind of knowledge-based. But there are these other things that we found limit someone's ability to adopt a BMP. And those are things like costs of a moisture meter, right? $1,500, that's an expensive thing for, for some facilities. Um, labor, the ability to go out and scout or visually check irrigation heads. Uh, that's tough when you only have two full-time people at a golf course, the infrastructure, golfer expectations play into this too. So it, it, was, it wasn't quite black and white when people did or didn't do a BMP and that was uh, what led us to wanting Rick Brick to come on and talk uh, about his practical experience as a superintendent. Um, so Rick, as I uh, get out of this screen and, and let you um, transition to yours, I'll just say that, that Rick uh, Slattery has been a really important part to Frank and I uh, in this education phase and, and building this project because he has this practical component, this ability to explain, okay, here's why people may or may not do this sort of thing that is 
uh, a lot less cut and dry than we'd like to think, which is, hey, just go do it. Um, so we're going to hear from Rick today about his experiences as a superintendent in these kind of black and white, in this gray area in between the black and white, um, and how he was still able to adopt uh, a lot of these BMPs. And, and, uh, and he'll talk about that uh, today. Okay. Uh, thanks, Colin, Frank. And uh, I'd like to start by just saying that uh, my career uh, working on golf courses began in 1970. And I've seen and witnessed a lot during that time. Uh, I would like to share some of, some of what I witnessed during my career and mix that in with what I learned during this project. While completing the surveys, we encountered a wide spectrum of golf courses, and I've worked at all of those different types at one point or another during my career, from small public, municipal, one owner, semi-private, one of the best in the world, Oak Hill. And I also uh, hosted the LPGA for 19 years at Locust Hill Country Club. And because of the variety of golf courses we visited during the surveys, we also encountered a wide variety of types of irrigation systems, which I will show here. And I can say, also say that I've operated all of those types at one point or another in my career. Now, in my opinion, water management is a cornerstone of BMP. Everything starts with that and everything else seems to branch off of that. It seems more water that we use, the more fertilizer we use, and that leads to more fungicides and the ball just gets rolling down in that direction. But uh, more input breeds more input. And I hope to show during these slides that uh, improving uniformity is the key to success. Uh, this is a roller basin system that uh, we uh, encountered at quite a few of our golf courses. Uh, it's not much different than a person that was gonna water their home lawn uh, it's very rudimentary. Uh, you have a, a quick coupler valve uh, off to the side of the green, which you plug a hose into and move this uh, roller base around on, uh, you know, onto the dry spots of the green and, and uh, to, that's how you get your green watered. But uh, with these rudimentary manual systems, it's, it's really impossible to keep up with replacing the daily loss, loss of water or ET just, just due to their limited capacity to pump water. A lot of these guys are hooked onto municipal water or they're just pumping out of a small pond on the property. And uh, they just have a limited amount of water that they can get out and they get into a, a, an extended dry spell and they're not watering fairways. Uh, they, they're just uh, basically trying to keep the greens alive. Uh, never mind trying to keep up with ET or anything like that. They're just trying to keep, keep their greens alive and, and get, maybe get a lot, a little bit of water on their tees. But ironically, uh, during our visits, I. I saw some very high percentage bent grass greens at, at some of these smaller public golf courses. And I attribute that to the, the limited amount of water that the greens were getting. Uh, one course that I visited actually had one valve for three greens. So they not only had to move the roller basin from around on each green, uh, but they also had to move it around uh, from green to green. Uh, this is the next step up. And this is a, a quick coupler system with impact sprinkler. And uh, to operate a system like this, uh, you basically usually had uh, this. I had one of these at Center Point Country Club. You'll have two, two valves, these quick couple of valves here um, uh, around the green, uh, maybe a couple in the tee. And if you're lucky, you'll have a row of them up the fairways. But the typical uh, way to operate these was uh, we would come in at about midnight and get our pumps all primed up and probably get our first set out uh, around one o'clock. Now, Usually you put a sprinkler in on, on one on each hole and uh, to move that sprinkler would take, would take roughly 45 minutes to an hour to uh, tour the golf course and move the sprinkler. So with three sets in the greens, uh, starting at one, we'd be done at four o'clock in the morning. We'd be done with two sets with the tees at six. And then we'd have a groundskeeper that would come in at six and we'd put our first, uh, first impact sprinkler in the fairway and have a, a groundsman move that up our fairway until we were done, maybe around one or two o'clock in the afternoon. Now, um, just the, with these type of manual systems, uh, they provided a self-imposed restraint from overwatering just because of the simple, just because of the difficulty of operating them. Uh, if I saw a little bit of wilt in a fairway at three o'clock in the afternoon, you know, I'm not gonna go through the process that I just described to get a little water on the golf course. Um, and because of the difficulty of running these systems, we strive to make it from rainstorm to rainstorm just so we wouldn't have to come in at night and start watering. So we did everything we could to strengthen that turf so that we wouldn't have to come in at night and water. 
Now, striving for better uniformity, I made actually two changes with this system. Uh, I couldn't change the run times because obviously they're 45 minutes to an hour to make a tour around the golf course. So I changed the nozzle sizes instead and we color coded them so we could, we could see them at night. And uh, we put the large nozzles into the dry areas and we put the smaller nozzles into the wet areas and uh, we achieved pretty good uniformity that way. And the second thing I did was I eliminated the night waterman position and began uh, watering myself uh, with my assistant at night. And I just felt it was just too, uh, watering the golf course properly was just too important uh, not to get it right. And as soon as we started doing that, I saw a huge improvement in the golf course and the playability of the golf course. The next step up from that was uh, to go to either the single row or double row automatic system. Uh, and uh, you can see here the area uniformity basically extends out to the last main line here uh, on, the, on the system. If you had a single row system, it's, uh, the uniformity was, would even shrink up even more than that. Now, as you can see, the difficulty here is that uh, you're getting proper uniformity between the, between the lines because you're getting overlap from each head. But outside that main line, you're only getting ha half the amount of water that you're getting in the middle of the fairway. So, uh, and, in, and to add insult to injury, what happens along this edge of the fairway here, you get the pickup pass with your fairway mowers, uh, you've got golf cart traffic running down through there, and, uh, and you're only getting about half the amount of water. So that's a high stress area. Uh, also, uh, so because of that, uh, spin rate was very important to me when I was operating these systems. I wanted to make sure that the sprinkler could make a full rotation during the lowest runtime that I would use. Reason being is that uh, let's say if I turn this sprinkler on here and it started here and it turned around here, but it shut off here as it was coming back around, well, that area or outside that main line um, now is not getting half the amount of water, but it might not get any water at all. So I always wanted to make sure my heads uh, would turn, make a full rotation during the lowest run time that I would run. Now, the other uh, aspect of these systems was sometimes they would come in a block system. Um, more than one valve might operate two sprinklers or might even operate four sprinklers. So I, would, I used my uh, knowledge that I used about changing nozzles out from uh, the, the prior system and uh, basically uh, did that with these block, with these block systems. Um, let's just say the upper part of this fairway is dry and the lower part of this fairway is wet. Well, I would put uh, the big, a bigger nozzle into the upper, into this sprinkler here in the upper portion and put a smaller nozzle down here uh, where it was wetter. Um, but as I noticed in, in the 1970s and the early 80s, as more and more automatic systems were added to golf courses that the playing surface started to change. And in some good ways and some not so good ways, I noticed they began taking on that lime green POA look. At the time, I didn't know it was POA, but I did notice that the, the golf courses that were being irrigated in this way uh, took on a different color. And I just, I found out that in uh, witness that uh, I felt that less water promotes stronger, healthier turf grass. And back then uh, I lived by the motto of tough love and lean and mean. And uh, the less water, uh, the healthier, the healthier surface that you had. Um, this was a uh, infrared uh, photo that I had taken when I first came to Locust Hill. Um, you can see that the poor uniformity here on the edges of the fairways. And you can see the good uniformity here up around the green. Uh, you can see how it's a nice uniform color. It's a nice pinkish reddish color. You might have smaller sprinklers around the green. You might have small, uh, less spacing, do a little hand watering. That's the reason you might get a little better uniformity there. But as you come out into the fairway here, uh, you know, you get more acreage. They, you know, the designer might've spread the spacing out a little bit. Uh, you got bigger sprinklers and, uh, you know, you just start to get some poor uniformity here. Um, now, when I went to Locust Hill Country Club now, and, and the way that golf courses basically dealt with this problem was they would water for the dry area and make that dry area look like the green up here. Well, what happened in the center area was it was getting extremely overwatered. And when I went to Locust Hill, uh, one of my directives was to uh, correct that. Uh, golfers were landing balls here in the center of the fairway. They were plugging, they weren't rolling. Um, there was a high amount of poanya 
uh, probably 90, 95% poanya, a lot of thatch. Uh, and then out here on the edge, if a ball landed out here on the edge, a ball would bounce and skip and, and roll away. So, uh, you know, to correct that uh, inconsistency was, was something that I was charged with when I, when I uh, arrived at Locust Hill. And I came to the conclusion that it just became too easy to water with automatic irrigation systems to mask the poor uniformity. You know, back if you had to, like I say, operate that manual system, you think twice. Uh, if you, all you're doing is going in and pushing a button in your office to turn it on, it's a lot easier to do that. And in my opinion, all this overwatering led to weaker turf grass that required more pesticides, more fertilizer, and more water to survive. On a side note, um, I think wetting agents can help with the uniformity and uh, quite a bit with the uniformity and they are actually cost effective for smaller clubs. Uh, I think you can find a, find a good, good, good wetting agent for a good price. But it comes down to managing the drives for the dry spots. And uh, this is one way that uh, I had to deal with it at Locust Hill was I had to, by turning down the automatic irrigation system, uh, we ended up uh, focusing more on hand watering those dry areas and, and that way uh, getting better uniformity and better playability. Uh, but how, who can afford to do this? Um, not many golf courses can afford to do this. And what I would do is uh, if I had a lot of people available for hand watering, I would rely on the automatic system less. If I didn't have very many people available that day or that week, I would rely on the, I would probably turn the automatic system on a little bit more. Um, during, I can say that during the weeks leading up to the LPGA, I relied on the automatic system less and less, and I focused more on hand watering like this. And the other reason I did that was I wanted to dry the golf course out as much as I could to build up a reservoir so that if any rainfall did fall during the during tournament week, the golf course would absorb it readily. From there, uh, actually, I used that infrared photo at Locust Hill, uh, and I was able to sell the need for a new irrigation system at Locust Hill. Um, we'll be able to show them the defects that they had and how we could improve that. And as you can see with the triple row, um, there's, tri there's three main lines of water and the area of good uniformity extends out to the edge of the fairway. So you're extending that uniformity out even further, which is a big help. The other thing that uh, is, is, uh, is consistent with these three row systems is you get individual head control. So you can turn on each head uh, sprinkler uh, with a different runtime than the other ones. So the uh, focus on changing nozzles was, was, was a lot less because I could change the run times. Um, but uh, uh, the large, these, these systems here have large capacity. And uh, I could, I, my, my system at Locust Hill could had the ability to pump 1800 gallons a minute. That allowed me to have a two and a half hour water window. In other words, I could water the greens, tees, and fairways in about two and a half hours. So I could wait until the last possible minute uh, and see a lot of wilt out there before I turn the irrigation system on. And I could also wait till about five o'clock in the morning if I thought we might get some rain at night and turn the, turn the system on when I get into work and uh, I could have a golf course watered by 7.30. But some of the drawbacks in, in, with, with these systems here is number one, it's really easy to overwater. Uh, you can just really just overwater really quickly and, and, and it's very, it's, it seduces you and you, before you know it, the golf course is overwatered. The other thing that's challenging is I had 1400 heads, 1400 sprinklers at Locust Hill. And to visually check all those and keep them all operating properly was a challenge. And I think what you'll see is with a lot of the upper tier golf courses, is that uh, they hire an irrigation tech and that's only that's just their job to do that alone. So how does irrigating affect the water holding capacity of the soil, especially overwatering? Well, I devised this uh, graph here and it's not driven by any data that I had, but it's purely conceptual. Um, but if you take this solid line here in the center and we call that the saturation level of the soil, uh, and let's say the threshold A here is this dotted line. That is where you would turn, normally turn your irrigation system on. So as your golf course down here dried out a little bit, you turn the irrigation on and you get this kind of a flow here. Um, but then what happens when you get an inch and a half of rain? You spike up into this wet area up at the here. You might dry out a little bit, you get more rain. 
and then as you start coming down to a dry period, you might get past back to saturation level. But if you get another couple inches of rain or whatever, you're back up here where you're, where you're just too wet again. So what, what drives this the threshold A is a lot of things. Uh, you know, you might have a lot of poa, you might have short roots, uh, you might have members that we want you to keep the greens that, so that they can hold. Uh, but what thrives in that zone? Greens that hold. Um, golfers like that. Weak turf grass, poanya, short roots, more ball mark damage. The ball mark damage is, is really, really severe. Um, you can get some deep, deep splattering ball marks if you keep your greens wet all the time. And also high disease pressure. Um, getting a lot of, you know, that turf canopy is wet all the time. You're going to have a lot of disease pressure. So what I did with Oak, Locust Hill was I tried to drive that threshold down, down, down to where you see it down here below. And the way I did that was I just, uh, every dry spell that we got, I just let the golf course, try to let the golf course dry out a little bit more than the last time. And I'd have some dry spots show up and we'd hand water those. And if we had to, we'd aerify them and get some stronger turf grass, uh, you know, installed in those areas. But that's, it's a slow process. Um, but I would like to say that, uh, should point out that Locust Hill had heavy soils in the fairways and uh, greens were modified push-up, but the roots were growing deeper than the cup cutter and, and they were growing into the plant material. So what thrives in this zone down here below? You got firm greens, but the fairways are firm and they have a lot of rolls. So the golf course actually plays a lot shorter and the members like that. Uh, stronger turf grass, you might have bent grass, uh, but perennial poa too, I found that will adapt to the, uh, those conditions and will act a lot like uh, bent grass uh, if, it, if you give it a chance to. Deeper roots, ball mark damage is less severe. Uh, you might get a little skip, skip mark or a little smudge mark, but you don't get those deep, deep ball marks. And very low to disease pressure with a dry turf canopy all the time. Um, you know, very little, very little disease pressure. And I feel like the, pre the uh, proof was in the pudding with the LPGA here in, in 2013. We had had an extended drought uh, prior to the tournament. And Wednesday night prior to the tournament starting on Thursday morning, I had the golf course about as dry as I could get it. And we had rain start uh, Thursdays during Thursday's round, Thursday morning. And Thursday's round was canceled. And we got about two and a half inches of rain in about 12 hours. Well, I can tell you that we never even got back to saturation level with that amount of rain because of how dry I had the golf course. On Friday morning, we uh, had tee times on time, seven o'clock, and everybody was calling Rick a hero, but uh, I can tell you, I really didn't do anything. The only thing I did was I was able to drive the golf course out to this level so that we, when we did get uh, that heavy rain, uh, the golf course sucked it up like a sponge. And the other, one other thing I'd like to point out here is uh, I'll, I'll show a moisture meter later on, but a moisture meter can help you put a number on these threshold lines here. And it can help you uh, uh, manage for those uh, quite a bit better. Um, this is a, a simple catch can test um, to show this, and it can show you the same information that you saw on the infrared photo uh, by setting these out. Um, you can determine uh, what kind of coverage you have, what kind of uniformity you have. Um, but I would like to point out uh, the compound effect of the differences uh, that you might see of, in the collection of the water of these, these cups. Let's just say that uh, up here next to the water, the sprinkler, um, I get uh, a one tenth of an inch of water in that cup. Or let's say three tenths of an inch of water here next to the sprinkler. And then out here, I'm getting maybe a tenth of an inch of water in the cup out here. Well, operate that system over, let's say, 10 times over the next 10 days. Well, now you've got next to the sprinkle here, you've dropped essentially three inches of rain, whereas out here, you've dropped on the outer edge, you maybe only drop one inch of rain. That's quite a discrepancy. So that compound effect of the differences in your system can really create problems down the road. And... Uh, one of the things I've always done is I've always converted my irrigation run times from, minute, from minutes to inches and compared that to rainfall amounts. Um, I always like to know if I ran the system for 10 minutes that let's say I was putting out a, what would be equal to a quarter inch of rain. Uh, 
this uh, catch can test doesn't have to be this sophisticated. Um, I've even gone and put out just simple rain gauges, a couple, two, three plastic rain gauges, and just gotten my determination there to see how much uh, water I was applying as a, as a uh, related to rainfall. Um, you want to know how much you're using in relation to how much how much rainfall you're actually replacing. Uh, I had a colleague of mine um, and he's paying for city water and has to be budget conscious about what he's purchasing and spending. And he found that just by reducing fairway run times by two minutes, he was able to save enough water to water his greens and teas. Um, so you want to know how much you're using, how much water you're using. And uh, here is a uh, water meter. A, a moisture meter uh, that uh, we wanted to, wanted to point out here. And it has a number of benefits. It can, as I said before earlier, it can put a number on those threshold lines in the previous slide. Uh, it can also provide the same data uh, that you saw in that infrared photo. And uh, you can compare weather fluctuations and irrigation run times with the moisture meter data. Uh, after it rains, you can go out and and see uh, maybe what a quarter of an inch of rain does to the uh, does to the uh, soil and underneath your greens. How much how much did this number go up? But basically, uh, by putting these prongs into the green, it'll give you a number and give you a baseline number of let's say if that gets down to eleven or twelve, then you know you got to turn the irrigation system on. But the benefits of a moisture meter are that it will they take the guesswork out of when to water. Uh, they can provide, the data can provide owners and members with information on how and when you water. Uh, if they ever ask questions, you can show them uh, exactly what, how your decision-making process is. And it provides data for uh, municipalities on your irrigation practices in the event of water restrictions. And uh, in, in both cases, it just shows that uh, responsible water use uh, of your water resources. If you cannot, can't afford a moisture meter, I would suggest at least using a soil probe. Um, I've used these my, my entire career, can give you a lot of information. I can tell you how much uh, thatch you've got here in the soil. Um, it can show you if you have any layering in the soil uh, that would prevent water from moving down through the surface. Uh, you can see how quickly your greens are drying out, how deeply they're drying out. And it, I think it just provides, it's just a good idea to provide uh, for have a good visual check under the surface every once in a while to poke that thing in there and your dry spots, whatever, and see what's going on. And I fashioned one of these out of a broken golf club. Uh, I actually took a broken golf club, sawed it off, cut it off here and ground out a window in here and uh, use that. And uh, I can also say that superintendents at the smaller clubs I worked at, they were always the ones to change cups. Uh, a lot of information can be learned from your cup cutters. Uh, that you're taking out a six inch plug out of your green almost every day. And uh, you can look down in there and see what's going on and uh, how, wet, how wet your green is and how quickly it's drying out and just provide you with a lot of information. Throughout my career, I've always used weather data to make my irrigation decisions as far back as I can remember. <laughs> this is my office in the, in the late 1990s. And uh, you can see here on the right, I was uh, subscribing to DTN Weather Service. I had a, a satellite dish outside my shop. I was getting up-to-date information on the uh, radar coming in, and uh, they would also supply me with weather data that I could use. On the left-hand side here, it was my PC with my software for my irrigation system. And I would use the weather data to make my adjustments with my irrigation software. So. If I have uh, any advice, I would say uh, try to think of irrigation as supplemental to rainfall uh, and not as a replacement for rainfall. Today, weather data is free at your fingertips and uh, you can get pull up any app and you can get uh, weekly uh, forecasts. You can get uh, hourly forecasts uh, over here on the right. You can uh, NOAA has a good website where you can pull up eight, 10 to six, 10 day outlooks, eight to 14 day outlooks. It's just good to know and you know, have a pretty good idea what the trend is gonna be in the next 10 to 14 days. So you can kind of set up your irrigation uh, practices uh, you know, going into those uh, periods. But you know, I can point out here if it's gonna be warmer than normal, cooler than normal, wetter than normal, drier than normal. And I think that's all good information. Uh, 
Now we always talk about a lot about ET for being with BMPs and to use ET, uh, but we found during our surveys that there were a lot of a lot of guys out there that didn't know what ET was, and in fact, uh, the the engineers at RIT uh, weren't familiar with uh, ET uh, either. Uh, but ET is basically the reverse of rainfall. It's a measurement of water leaving the soil by evaporation and transpiration, and it helps uh, with when deciding when to water and how much. Uh, in theory, essentially, uh, if I'm at the point where I need to water and I got an inch of rain, and let's say uh, I'm averaging uh, about two tenths of an inch of uh, water loss of ET each day, well, that means in about five days, I'll be right back where I started from and then looking to probably need to water. Uh, but basically ET is a calculation of solar radiation, temperature, humidity, and wind. And in the absence of ET, if you can't find it anywhere or don't have access to it, all that information here is on your weather apps. You got the temperature, you got partly cloudy, you got the sun, you got UV index, uh, humidity, wind. Uh, you can just kind of generally look at those things and uh, decide what kind of a day it's going to be. Uh, we used to call uh, the, the worst days that uh, we, we saw for water loss were what we call high sky days. High sky day would be no clouds. Uh, low humidity, uh, maybe around 80 degrees, and uh, some wind, and uh, those days would 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 really perk up perk up your ears and and get out there and keep an eye on your greens because you're probably losing water uh, faster than uh, out of the plant than the plant roots can replace it, and that's when uh, you get the wilt and that's where you might have to run a syringe or do a little hand watering. Um, but basically, uh, in the absence of ET, if you can't find that anywhere, don't have access to it, the two the things I looked at probably the most was dew point and nighttime temperatures. And dew point can tell you a lot. And I made a lot of mistakes in my career uh, by just concentrating on temperature. And you get up into 95 degree temps, and we're all thinking, oh my God, it's hot, we got to water. But if that dew point is at the high 60s or even into the 70s, you're not losing any water. And if and in those kind of situations, um, I would just maybe do a little quick syringe during the day or maybe a little hand watering, but you're not losing any water out of the soil. And when I lost the most grass that I probably lost in my life was when I might water during a situation like that. And then now I've got the, 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 uh, the golf course is too wet. Uh, you can't dry it out. Um, and you start getting black algae, start getting rotting, uh, you know, disease starts kicking in. And that's when I would really have a lot of problems. And that's why I always like to stay on the dry, dry side of things. I always felt like I could add more water, but if I got the golf course too wet, I just could never dry it out. And uh, so where do you find ET? If you don't have a, a weather station on site that calculates that for you, uh, you, your best bet and the only bet you have is really to subscribe to a service like T3 Golf or DTN Weather Century. And they can provide you with a, a ton of information here, ET rate, radiation, soil temps, leaf wetness, um, all that can be at your finger lip, fingertips. Here's ET on an hourly basis, you can get it on a daily basis. Um, but uh, again, uh, these, these uh, Services can be a little pricey, but you know, eighty-five dollars, seventy-five, eighty dollars, eighty-five dollars a month, upwards to thousand dollars for a year. And I can honestly say that if I had a thousand dollars to spend, I would probably opt to purchase a moisture meter because it's a one-time cost, and it can pretty much provide me with pretty close to the same information. Um, but I'd like to say, uh, just point out that weather data is crucial to sound water management. And as my last slide here, uh, I just like to say that uh, a simple visual check can, can save a lot of headaches down the road. Um, I went by this piece of property about quarter of five every morning when on my way to work at Locust Hill. And every morning I'd see this one sprinkler here that was malfunctioning and just dropping water out into the pavement. And this went on for about six weeks and I kept wondering when they were gonna fix this. And then finally, as these trees started to dry and drop their leaves and the bushes started to dry out and the grass was dead from here up to here. And uh, finally, uh, I came through and uh, this head was fixed. And uh, I guess the lesson learned there is I would say is 
don't wait till you get dead grass and, and dead shrubs and dead trees before you fix your irrigation system. Uh, try to get out there and do a visual check ahead of time and be proactive and get these things fixed uh, before you create your problems down the road. So I'd like to end with uh, just saying that no matter what type of system you're working with, if it isn't working properly, it's just not gonna give you what you want. Uh, you wanna try to maximize the performance of whatever system you have that you're working with. And uh, with that, I'll uh, send it back. Thanks, to Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Carl, before we uh, get some comments from you and, uh, and I wrap up here, uh, I just want to say what a joy it is to take that uh, historical view of this. I'm so glad we have this uh, on tape now to, to, for, for others to listen to because you did a wonderful job of, of really taking us through from the various levels of the way you want to get uniformity. And let's just say that last picture is a good example. That little strip of grass plus the flower bed there, these are not easy areas to water. They're not easy because they're topographically challenged. You got different plants maybe there. Um, and, and, you know, heads are out there, 1,400 things that can get hit. And it's hard to keep track and it's hard to do. And so finding the keys, like Rick said, uh, to making it simpler, to conceptualizing it, to make it a little bit easier to do. By doing that, Rick, you said in some cases you're able to maximize your labor resources, right? And that's what I think one of the things we've learned from this project is your interaction with half the golf course superintendents that aren't members of the GCSAA and don't have the kinds of systems that we typically talk about in these uh, webinars that assume you can do all those technological things. So big shout to you, Rick. Thanks for doing that. I do have a big question for you, and that is, you know, when you um, start to make a transition, like I just listened to you and I'm hearing you say, you know, I probably got to dry this out a little bit more. It's not likely my system works really well, but you know what? I got a lot of polar right now. I got a lot of annual bluegrass that I want to keep a lot. Can you tell me the process you go through uh, when you're thinking about making these shifts to, to, to use water more efficiently or a drought emergency plan comes in and you're forced to use water more efficiently. What did you see in those transition times when you had one grass that was sort of a, a sin of riches, water, fertilizer, right? All the things maybe we do a little too much of. How did that transition look for you? Well, uh, I think th that's, that comes in with education. I think you definitely have to educate your members and you have to educate your owners and everybody has to kind of buy into it. Uh, but to me, it, it, it was a lot, it's a lot like an addiction. And uh, you can go cold turkey, you can kind of, kind of go slow. Um, but uh, again, I would always uh, uh, would, uh, make my decisions basically based on, uh, again, golfer expectations. I think a lot of guys, uh, job security is a huge thing. Um, you know, when, when it comes down to, am I gonna turn that irrigation on? And keep my job or am I going to let it dry out and let the pole weaken up a little bit um, but I think the big key that I would I would talk about is 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 the selection of species I mean what do you want to grow look at your green look at your fairway what have you got and then try to main, manage to the strongest denominator a lot of times we manage to the weakest denominator and we take the what the weakest turf is and we water to that but what I always try to do is I always manage to the strongest denominator and you take the weakest denominator and you try to build that up and strengthen it so it can handle what the stronger grasses are doing. So I think look at your turf, look at what you've got. It's okay to let that pole turn a little off color, I think. And in that way, it's not so quite so puffy and doesn't make your green quite so bumpy, but it, it's, all, it's all your own comfort level and your own confidence level with how far you want to push some of these things. Yeah. Uh, forward, forward. And, yeah. And certainly a little bit more dramatic in fairways, right? Where you have a little more tolerance for a little bit weaker grass, uh, a little bit trickier to do on putting surfaces when you're trying to get playing quality and keep people moving through. But, but it sounds like what you said, and Carl, I'll pass it to you is, is Rick's the real long view here, the real ecological view, you know, pick mm -hmm. the, you know, the survival of the fittest and I'm going to, help what I'm going to pick that species and I'm going to manage it because in the long view, 
it's going to be the more resilient species. Thanks very much, Rick. Carl, I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, so I think continuing on that thread, Frank, you know, I think of it almost as an evolutionary uh, evolutionary kind of management system you, you employed, Rick, both at Locust Hill and Centerpoint, where you took this long view converting kind of POA areas into bentgrass areas, but even you yourself, uh, you almost responded evolutionarily when you were at Centerpoint, this idea that you had three different sprinkler heads in the impact sprinklers, a, a small head for areas that would collect water, a big head for the areas that maybe sheeted water more. Um, you know, and I'm thinking about the, the new kind of crop of superintendents coming out these days who have immediate access to an automatic irrigation system, most likely, and they didn't get a chance to learn the lessons that you got to learn at center point and then moving up through the industry. What advice would you have to, to those people who kind of start with, you know, the Cadillac systems, the ability to push a button, um, whereas you got to learn, you know, kind of these, these ways to manage water that were very judicious because of your system inadequacies early on. What advice would you have to those sort of people who uh, are thrust right into a, a nice system and can probably get, it's very easy to overwater initially. Yeah. Um, I probably, a lot of people don't agree with me on this, but I think everyone should probably start out operating in a, a, a manual system at some point in their career and before they give into the keys to the Ferrari, um, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, I think visually check, I think the, the biggest thing is you learn uh, when you're when you're manually operating a system, you you learn uh, uh, you see you actually visually see things happening, and I think one of the big problems that uh, I see a lot and I ran into myself is when you're running this at night, and you never see your your irrigation operate. Um, that's 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 not good, and I think to, to to actually see your system operate, see what it's doing to the surfaces. And, uh, and, and, and I think that to operate it during the daytime, just visually check it, I think is a lot of what I would say, but, um, yeah, uh, that's a big, that's a big, it's, it, the automatic systems really seduce you into applying more water than you need. And I guess that's when I would point back to a lot of those practices that we talked about in the slides was using those to guide you, uh, and, and the water meter to guide you if you have you have a, a number here that you know you start to wilt or lose grass at and you start approaching that number then you go ahead and you start watering and that gives some people the confidence to maybe let things go a little longer than they might normally would so instead of going by the seat of your pants uh, to try to use some of the data that we showed in the slide presentation to help you make those decisions yeah and, and you know the other thing i think rick and, and you did a great job of your presentation going through this you know, small system to big system. And as you move to those bigger systems, whether it's the impact sprinklers, single row to triple row, you get more heads, there's more responsibility, there's more need for, you know, constant irrigation checking and updating and repairs. Um, so there's this idea that that as you scale up, there's, there's more need to be more precise in, in your management, not only of repair, but of, of, uh, of checking moisture areas. Um, so when, when you got to Locust Hill, can you just talk about how you used, um, you know, you talked about that infrared data. You really use data and documentation to argue for a system like that because it would help the club. You know, when we when we gone through our surveys, we, we saw those documentation portions, whether it's the drought emergency plan or a map of runoff areas. Um, people didn't do those very well. And so could you speak to how you use that documentation version to advocate for resources at your club or, you know, justify water use. Uh, I need X amount of water to keep the golf course alive. Can you talk about the importance of, of documenting that stuff and keeping some data, uh, not just to have it on a piece of paper, but to actually use it, whether it's to advocate for resources or to justify uh, water use on the golf course? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think one thing that people don't, uh, connect uh, with water use is the amount of electricity it takes to operate your pumps. If you're not, if you're not uh, paying for water, uh, you're paying for electricity to run your pumps. And, and my electricity at Locust Hill could run eighteen to $20,000 a year. And that, that speaks uh, volumes with members. Um, so if you can reduce that for them. Um, but in the most, in, in mostly though, they're, they're concerned about playing conditions. And, uh, 
one of the one of the things I can say was uh, I was in an actually in a meeting uh, promoting the new irrigation system, and I pulled up that uh, infrared slide, and I had a member say to me, he said, "Rick, we were told by the last superintendent that the irrigation system was going to be like rainfall." And I pulled up the infrared photo and I said, that's not rainfall. And so it kind of sold it right there. But another big selling point for me at Locust Hill was to eliminate the hand watering because with that triple roll system, I had so much better coverage and uniformity that we were able to reduce the hand watering down to a very, very small amount. And that was a big thing with the members was to maybe get those hoses and get those people out of the fairways um, and, and that kind of thing. So but I did see that, you know, you, you, you try to, you put in these triple row systems with the idea you're going to use less water because you've got better uniformity. But the, the, again, it, it's a seductive thing. It seduces you into using it more than you should. And you can really overwater much quickly, much more quickly than you could. Um, but, uh, but essentially, I would say that as far as Locust Hill went, that infrared photo really, really showed a lot. Now, you can use the, the water meter now, uh, like I said, the catch can test. There's a lot of other things that you can use to establish that data and, and, and provide that with them. So um, there were a lot of, lot, of, lot of things that I used to uh, help to try to sell that going forward. And uh, the bigger thing was, uh, again, uh, when, you, when you're dealing with a membership is playability. And if you can improve playability and, uh, you know, like I say, I mean, when I arrived there, we had the wet spots in the middle of the fairway and we had dry spots on the edge of the fairway. Um, anything you can do to make that experience better for the golf co golfers, uh, uh, I think, is a, is a plus. Okay. We are at the witching hour, fellas. Uh, Rick, Carl, thank you very much. And big thanks to our partners at RIT, the Pollution Prevention Institute, uh, for providing the resources for this, for us to work together, uh, which is of course provided by the DEC through the state of New York. So we're really happy to be partnering with the state on this project, to be able to bring the university, uh, the state, the Pollution Prevention Institute, uh, and of course practitioners like Rick Slattery uh, into the mix to help improve implementation of these important practices. So without any further ado, I'll thank you both very much uh, for joining me. Uh, Rick, again, so great to hear from you, Carl. It's such been a pleasure working on this project with you guys, and we'll look forward to the other three installments that we'll have announcements for in the coming weeks. Thank you all very much, and I hope you have a wonderful day. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.